היי לירז, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you, איתן? וואו, אני מרגיש מאוד מאוד טוב, ואני מאוד 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 מא
uh, was fixed in my mind. And um, after I started psychotherapy and I started treating people, I understood that um, it is not for me. Um, so I'm not uh, the kind of person who could actually um, listen carefully. I have to tell people what to do. And um, then I got this amazing proposal from, and this was my, um, actually my bridge to the tech world. So um, as I was treating people, I got this proposal from an Israeli startup company. Um, uh, this company was acquired by now, but uh, back then it was an amazing opportunity. And they, uh, what they did is that they have developed uh, a platform. It was a SaaS company. Mm -hmm. And uh, when a user enters a website, they were able to detect uh, the, the user's interaction from the moment they entered the website to the moment they leave the website. And um, mainly behavioral analytics. And for me, it was, um, I was exposed to a whole new world because this world was untouched by the academia. Because it was, if you think about it, a different way, a different tool to um, explore a user's behavior. And the amazing thing is that you didn't need to um, bring them to the lab and uh, manipulate them, you could actually look at them in real time. So, of course, I'm sure you think about the ethical issues, and there are ethical issues, but back then I had this all new world of understanding how women uh, behave different from men and users who came first to the website they ha behave differently from users who have been in this website five times. So it was an amazing opportunity. And um, after um, I was there like for five years and eventually I got the group of data scientists and I was able to develop this model. I called it, I call, back then I called it mindset. And um, the idea was that the minute um, a user enters a website, we were able to detect its mindset. If it was focused, if it was goal-oriented, if it was uh, disoriented, if it came just to browse or to explore. So um, actually we were able to um, define these behavioral patterns with different models, with different algorithms. And then the holy grail was to change the website according to the user's specific mindset. So um, that actually, th this was my first experience in the tech world. And the amazing thing was that I was able to combine my models, the behavioral models, the cognitive models with actual users' behavior. And back then I was calling myself a, a web psychologist. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this is what brought me to, to the tech world. Nice, nice. So what about this company? So you say it got acquired, right? Yes, and, yes. Yeah. By a French company called Content Square. Yeah. Yeah, Content Square. Nice. So can you share with us a little bit about these these models around behavioral, you know, design and decision making? Sure. So um behavioral design, it is actually a practical model that uh, is drawn out of um, behavioral economics. Mainly behavioral economics is the theoretical models and behavioral design is how you can bring it to, into practice. And um, the idea, and back then, um, Kahneman and Tversky were talking about um, our biases. And um, Kahneman then talked about uh, us having two different systems. System one is one system, system two. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> system one is the emotional system. It is the automatic system. It doesn't require cognitive resources. And as a matter of fact, 80% of our time, we use this emotional biased system. Yeah. And only 20% of the time, we use our rational system. And the reason that we don't like to use a rational system it is because it requires 
requires lots of cognitive effort. So while you use your rational system or system two, you cannot be involved in any other task at the same time. So when we're talking about, uh, to your question, when we're talking about uh, behavioral design is how you can shape people's behavior if you know how people think, if you know uh, their cognitive biases. Let me, let me give you an example. You know that um, it's not so common in Israel, but in the state, if you have vending machine like Coca-Cola, right next to it, you have a Pepsi vending machine. And uh, people were wondering, I mean, why? Uh, why this company decided, because this is a decision, <laughs> this is an economical decision, why they decided to place these vending machines together, uh, one next to the other. And um, the answer is that they know how people think. And uh, I will give you an example that demonstrates what I'm saying. Let's say that um, entering um, a bagel uh, store. I, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I'm angry and I want to eat something and I, I'm not sure what I feel like. And then I enter this bagel store. And uh, in that exact moment, the um, the seller, she can, ha she have actually two different options. The first option is to ask, um, what do I feel like if I feel like bagel? And this is the wrong option. Mm -hmm. Second option is if she asks me, okay, what do you like me to put in your bagel? And this is a better option because she knows how I think, that she knows if she asks me what I feel like, I will ask myself, do I feel like bagel? But if she already skip this decision, Mm -hmm. And right away went to the, what do you want in your bagel? Then my options are avocado or cream cheese or whatever. This is a different question that she asked me. And this is what I'm going to answer. Yeah. And in the same way, if you think about um, cola versus Pepsi, I don't ask myself, do I feel like a Coke? I ask myself, okay, well, do I feel like cola or Pepsi? Okay. So they skip one decision, and of course, they have better revenue, both companies. Interesting. So it's not a question of if, it's just now a question of selecting between, between exactly. the two options, right? Exactly. You know, in my spare time, which is not a lot, I, I study brain science, and I learned also about the Kahneman models, the system one, system two, and it really was kind of a shock for me at the beginning. They claim to ninety five percent are system one decisions, like yeah, without you using, know, but, but, but it doesn't matter. Open the brain, and you can actually see system Not, one, system two. Yeah, and of course, we are talking about. Um, set of area brain areas that yes it's not i mean you're not and it's all come comes from like energy preservation right trying to <clears throat> eliminate the use of your energy right not using the prefrontal prefrontal cortex and it's it's amazing to think it doesn't matter if it's 80 percent or 95 percent all those all those decisions are made like uh, through our instinct without even thinking about it and then we activate our prefrontal frontal cortex system to to explain ourselves why we've made that decision Rationalize, right? right we are talking about two stages decision yeah. and it's always a two stages decision so if you if you um enter a supermarket so the first thing um you you notice is the smell of the croissant right mm -hmm. we figured out that in this specific moment while you smell this bakery sense the decision is already made, but then from that moment on, from after you already made unconsciously the decision till you are going to the bakery, there are a set of thoughts that um, is brought to your mind and the sets are, okay, so I did my sports activity this week and um, I didn't uh, eat uh, nothing else. And... Um, this all rationalization. And then when you actually bought the bakery, you feel that you made this rational decision, but this decision was already made by your senses. Yes, and probably by the local supermarket and the, and the shelf location and the, the, the right. way that they've structured right. everything, knowing that 
you might you already make this unconscious decision now let's provide you with few steps or messages just to trigger you to select this Corazon or that bagel, right? Yeah, so we have no idea how much the senses, because we are thinking, we, we try to simplify it. So we, we keep thinking, okay, our emotion um, is the subconscious part, but there is a major difference between our senses and our emotion. Our senses, basically our six senses, what we smell, what we hear, what we see, mm -hmm. how we feel in terms of temperature, However, emotion is a bit different, is how we feel, is if we are frustrated or anger or sad. So both uh, affect our decision, but in different ways. And also our perception affects our decision. So generally you can speak of emotional part, but um, if you get into the details, it's not uh, that simple. So you have different... Um, factors or different categories of influence on how you make decisions. Yes. Yes. I mean, you gave a great example on the, on the retail side, let's say offline brick and mortar type of experience. But if you take it to a digital experience, for example, an e-commerce platform, we know it is all based on impulse purchases, right? right. So everyone talks about impulse purchase, which is like the main vehicle of any e-commerce purchase, right? W what does it mean? Can you, can you help us understand what impulse purchase really means? That this let's try to analyze this aspect and how people are taking a decision to make a purchase that they didn't even know they need you know a few seconds ago i i will explain but <laughs> um i will explain by using an example that i really like um there are um, a branch of stores in the states jc penny and um the, those stores they have this strategy and people thought that this is a very um, narrow, selfish strategy, but it worked. And the strategy was to start off with, um, with prices and then immediately cut the prices uh, in a half. And then people started buying. And it was, I mean, it was their, uh, this is what they enjoyed of. I mean, they really like to search the store and the store looked like a, a garage, but they liked it. <laughs> and um, it was like a flea market in uh, with an air conditioning. And then there was a, a new CEO who came. I don't remember the exact year, but he decided that we are living in different times and these are different consumers, and they're no longer interested in searching for, uh, for sales or for discount. So he decided to be honest and level with his customers, and there were no more discounts and no more sales, and they started off with lower prices to begin with. Mm -hmm. And um, they were... Um, near closing all the stores yeah. until they um, actually um, brought back this strategy. And the reason is that consumers are not rational. And if we really want to empathize with our consumers, we need to understand that they are not rational and they want us to understand their needs because they don't want to spell it out. There is no one consumer who will tell you, yeah, I love the uh, the sales, I love the discount, I love the search. <laughs> no. So you need to figure it out yourself and to provide the consumer what he wants. So of course he will tell you, yeah, of course, be level with me, be honest with me. No, there is what we call empathy gap. And empathy gap is the gap between what people will tell you and what really motivates their behavior. And actually, um, Netflix discovered this empathy gap because Netflix were, was asking um, their um, the users what you are going to see uh, in the weekend. And people were telling, yeah, I'm going to see the commentary. I'm going to see World War II movies, of course, <laughs> because they were uh, busy in impression management. They think about what will make them look good. Unconsciously, of course, this is not as if they, yeah, what is going to make me feel good. They actually felt that this is what uh, suits them 
And of course, it, uh, there is a weekend and Netflix sees that all the people that were talking about World War II <laughs> um, at, at the end of the day watched Emily in Paris. Yeah. So um, this is a gap that consumers need, to, uh, they need us to know about. Now, back to your question about impulse purchase. So if you think about J- JCPenney, what is an impulse purchase? What is an impulse? Impulse is the fact that there is no, um, no wall between what I want, what I think, and the actual Action. behavior. Yeah. So when we're talking about impulse purchase, these are purchases that were not planned. We didn't plan to buy it. We don't even need it, but we see it. And then they trigger our emotional path. And when our emotional paths are triggered, it is very hard to control them. So <clears throat> we purchase out of impulse and not out of our rational decision process. So, so these uh, uh, impulses or they are touching our what, our emotion because pricing is not is emotional. Like, okay, you see fifty percent discount, it triggers a purchase. Of course. What nerve it, it touches, right? We can touch few nerves, yeah. like few aspects so, of our behavior. Um, right? Actually, there is an answer because people actually took um, consumers to an fMRI machine um, and scanned their brain while mm-hmm. they were watching different products. Some were uh, with discount attack and some uh, were without. And they found out that if you see something that you don't need, and I emphasize something that you clearly don't need but it has the sign of a discount this there is a, a place in your brain that we call the value area where you yeah. place value on different products and as a magic the value of this product increases just because it was on per, on on sale or on a discount so um this is a very um, sophisticated, unconscious process of our brain that we attach value to things, even if you don't need them, just because they were on sale. Yeah. And um, there was uh, another uh, research, very interesting. Uh, again, they took people to an fMRI machine and they uh, were looking for people who like chocolate. So it wasn't very hard to find some people who like chocolate, but then they were looking for a chocolate that will be a consensus stick. So they came up with Godiva chocolate. So most people like Godiva. It's not mm-hmm. like Hershey or something. <laughs> and 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 then um, they showed them. They were exposed to this chocolate for four seconds and they wanted to see what's going on in the brain. And they uh, saw that the reward pathway was activated while they were seeing the chocolate. And then for another four seconds, they showed them the price. Mm -hmm. And it was, of course, unproportional because Godiva is highly expensive. And then they saw that they look at the brain and they saw that the pain area was activated. And this was like an actual pain area where your stomach hurts or where you're injured. This was the same area that was uh, activated and then they figure out that our brain does this amazing calculation so if the pain area was um, higher in activation then you are not going to purchase but if the reward area is more activated compared to the pain area then you are Mm -hmm. going to purchase so this is uh, a very simple calculation and whenever I conduct a workshop to sales people I tell them don't ever talk with people about price because then they will come to think rationally and they will the, the answer if we are talking about the answer is with cola and Pepsi the answer that we uh, that they will ask themselves is it worth it however if you are not going to mention price and you will um, connect them with in the emotional level the question that they will ask is do i like it these are two different questions yeah. and 
if they are going to ask, is it worth it? They are going to compare you to other products in the category. But if you are able to trigger emotions, then they will not compare you to anything. They will ask, how much do I like it? And this is a very important distinction for salespeople. And and actually, you know, I think this is the uh, most precious invention from a technology standpoint, because when uh, we ask people, we give them $200 to give or to uh, to use their credit card to pay $200. And we look at the pain level, we see that we are talking about uh, four or five times more pain <laughs> in when you when you actually hold the money. And when you compare between credit card and Amazon one-click purchase, Amazon one-click purchase doesn't hurt at all. This is amazing. There is no pain. So um, we need to come to think about the implications. Yes, yes. So we take decision unrationally and we are triggered by emotions. So you mentioned the value gap, for, for example, in a matter of pricing, but give us more example like it's like we need as a human right we need the social connection right we need like self fulfillment what are some of those emotion or like basic fundamentals that are important for marketeers to be so aware of so these are not emotions these are motivations Mot or needs okay. if you will yeah. um so uh when we're talking about emotion we are talking about how we categorize our feelings so mm -hmm. if I'm frustrated right now if I'm mad. So of course, th these are Ekman five types of emotion. You don't need, there are different theories, but emotion is how we feel. Motiva motivation, and this is a very important topic because when I conduct research for different companies, this is what I wanted to find out. So uh, let's say that I, not let's say, I actually conducted um, a research for a gaming company, a very big gaming company. And um, I uh, compare between Bingo and Solitaire. And I, I guess most people are familiar with these games. And what I found out is that Bingo, you are looking for pure escapism because you don't need to um, mentally think. There are no cognitive resources. Um, so it's really the excitement because you are mm -hmm. more passive. But when you are talking about solitaire, people felt that they are more active in the game. They have more control. They actually were talking with us about different strategies that they apply when I, they are playing this game. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about different motivation, motivation of recognition, to feel good, to feel uh, in control, or motivation, motivation of escapism. I don't like the reality or I need an escape from the reality, so I will play bingo. So these are just only two examples, but I will give you um, other examples. So I um, conducted a research for a, a startup. It was a new startup and they came up with this new dispenser um, uh, that will help you um, with dishes and uh, with spices um, in the kitchen. And they wanted to know how to market it. So they had an idea that the best thing to market this dispenser is for people who cook a lot. And I told them, okay, so before you are going with your, um, you are going to launch your uh, marketing strategy, wait, and let me do this research and let me talk to people. So today I have um, a startup uh, and um, I, I'm a co-founder and this startup actually uh, is developed a bot uh, a virtual uh, agent or a virtual assistant that actually chats with people uh, with video or with text or they can record himself. But the idea that this bot has an emotional intelligence. So instead of me interviewing people, because there is a limit to how many people I can interview, uh, this bot can talk to hundreds of people, but uh, this bot can handle this deep conversation. So it's not only, okay, what is... Uh, the best thing in the product, innovation uh, or technology or whatever. 
the bot can actually talk to people. And mm. the surprising thing is that people answer and they share their feeling and emotion and perceptions. So go, going back to uh, this research, we use this bot in order to talk to people who like to bake and like to cook. And uh, what we found out is that the people who are willing to spend um, a lot of money on this dispenser are not the people who cook the most because the people mm. who cook the most were the moms who were cooking for the children and they had no interest in um, in ex um, in uh, purchasing this expensive dispenser. However, it was about the motivation. The motivation of the mom was to show love and safety for her children. But the motivation of people who like to cook from time to time was recognition. They wanted to show people to have these host these dinners and um, show people, show their friends how good cook they are. Mm -hmm. So this was one motivation. And the second motivation was playfulness because people mm -hmm. felt like uh, children. So they didn't want to use recipe. What they want is to start baking or cooking their own dishes. And they actually really appreciated this time of playfulness. So uh, we found out that uh, unlike the mothers who cook every day, and this is the actual audience that they wanted to market to, mm -hmm. we found that they need to market to the people who felt escapism or playfulness and the people who wanted recognition. Yeah, interesting. I want to go back to this empathy gap that you mentioned previously, and people are actually not telling exactly why they made, they took a decision, right? And so, so consumer research, I think is, uh, and you've mentioned a few of the research that you did. I think it's a very area that is, that is very, very difficult to, to implement correctly and maybe under, really understand consumer sentiment about a specific brand. So how do you run these, uh, these researches? What are some of the tips that you can provide to professionally manage and run a, a successful right. research project? So if there is number one tip and they can forget all this conversation, they should only remember this. Never ask people direct questions. So, I mean, there are many uh, people who came to me, they, they wanted to launch a new product or new startup, and they asked people, okay, if this product was in the market, would you buy it? And <laughs> of course people say, yes, what do they care? Yeah. So uh, they need to actually view the behavior. So, uh, for example, I never ask people, okay, uh, what do you like or what you don't like? What do you like about? If I want to, for example, uh, recently I conducted research of people going to a mall to so ask them, okay, so please remember the last time you were at the mall. How did you feel? Who uh, did you go with? So uh, these are different people that actually talks about behavior. So uh, we keep finding this gap between what people say and what they really feel. So I, I will give you um, another, uh, another interesting example. Um, we did um, a research uh, comparing between uh, Snickers and Milky Way. These are both um, chocolate snakes. Um, and you, from like first sight, you can think, okay, these are exactly the same, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what's the difference? So here you have more peanuts, here you have more milk, but basically, or nougat, but they are the same. So no, they are not the same. They are not the same because they address different consumer needs. So we found that when you talk about sneakers, sneakers is something, a snake that you eat, if you um, happen to skip lunch and you need energy boost like Red Bull or Excel or different energy drinks. So uh, this will help you keep going in your day. Uh, so you eat it on the go, on the way, and it's like, uh, it's like lunch. Mm -hmm. 
However, Milky Way, you eat after um, an emotional experience, a usually a negative emotional experience. So you eat it alone and you eat it as a compensation Mm -hmm. And uh, you eat it when you feel sad and you need comfort. It's like an ice cream, like Ben and Jerry's or a, a, a glass of red wine. So um, if, and this is my second tip, if people will go to the functional features, it's not going to lead them anywhere. They really need to come up with the emotional features because what I found out is that people purchase because of their motivations, because of their emotion, because of how you make them feel. So if you don't know this information that I just provided, so maybe you will add more peanuts with your new, if you want to launch a new chocolate snake. Mm -hmm. But if you truly understand, you will go and you will uh, find out what uh, needs this chocolate snake address, and then you will know how to compete on what really matters or not on the this feature or that feature. Yeah, and that questioning, as you said, can't be like a direct question, right? It needs to be more... Uh, of course, people li- did, they don't know yeah. this. They only <laughs> told me because I asked them, okay, when in the last, is the last time you yeah. ate Milky Way and how did you feel and what was going on in your life? So I have to build this um, reality for them because um, they have this defense mechanism. We all have this defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. This is amazing mechanism that we have because if we knew our, um, our sensitivity, it will be very difficult uh, to cope with life. So it's amazing that we have them, but we have, psychologist to understand what's really going on yes and how do you balance i mean for the for the brand or for any business it's important to explain in details what's unique in the product what the product is doing how do you balance in terms of messaging right because you go to a lot of website and it's immediately like the feature set right you just they're just dumping all their features yeah. and there's nothing about you know, values and rewards and all these things that we talked about. How do you balance this to think? So, um, yeah, I really uh, think that people have today like trends, like not people, businesses have mm-hmm. these trends. And these are awful trends because, I mean, they have a mission statement and what they believe in and they have set of values. And for all the businesses, they are the same. So they are innovation and they um, are uh, they are based on AI or in technology, and they have quality. So <laughs> there is no different. And in order to stick, you really need to understand your narrative, what you believe in, because people will go with your brand not because it's better. It is because they believe in what you believe in. So um, take Arlie Davidson, for example. They believe in freedom in the road. So it's not about uh, this motorcycle. It's about they believe in what you believe in. And people are looking for um, for brands that they can empathize with, that they can say, yeah, they say they speak my words. So they don't speak their words if they say, yeah, I have a, a qualitative brand or I'm yeah. a logical brand no um this is nonsense you really need to understand who you are this is the first thing and the second thing is that the brands need to establish trust and brands need to give more before they want to take because i mean i keep saying it uh, to to the businesses i work with when they show me their marketing strategy or their campaign or messaging it's like you are in a party and then I come and I stand on the table and I uh, say to everyone in the party, attention, please look at me. I'm the most attractive person in this room. Come with me. And they will look at me. They will be a bit amusing and they will uh, keep talking. Yeah, and no one cares. <laughs> and this is what brands does when they don't establish trust, when they just 
scream, pick me, pick me. No, this is not the right way to go. They need to understand their value and their emotion, and then they need to build trust through narratives. Wow, interesting. And Lilas, how all of this is connected to storytelling? Because I think there are a lot of myths, right, in storytelling that needs to be addressed. Right, right. So um, the idea about storytelling, a good storytelling, is that if you provide me a few facts about your startup, or if you tell me a great story of what made you start your company, the facts are that I will remember more. I will remember mostly everything you said from the story, and I will forget 80% of the facts. And the reason is how our brain is built, because our brain from uh, evolutionary times is built to hear story. This is how we use to, um, to transfer information. However, our brain is not built to hear facts or to remember facts. And when I tell a story, but a good story, engaging story, if I tell a story, and you look at our brains, you'll see what we call neurocoupling. Our brains are going to synchronize. And uh, the more I tell the story and the more engaged you are, the more synchronized our brain will be. And this is the basis of connection between people. And this is also the basis of connection between brands and consumers. So they need to come up with a good story. So, of course, there are different ways to tell a story, but when you tell a good story, it's like you are in love because the same chemicals, the same brain chemicals that we see when people are in love, we see them when they hear a good story, a surprising wow. story, story that tells them something about themselves, something that they feel that they connect to, that they say, yes, I want to be part of this story. And if the brain only sells product, so people will leave him the moment they will have a better one. Yes, there's always a better one, right? And right. So, so the story of a brand is a story of the founder? What's no, it? no, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, it can be, um, when we're talking about a really good story, it can be how this brain is processed. Let, let me give you an, an example. Uh, there was um, a beer named Schultz. I'm not sure if it still exists, but I'm not sure. okay. it was an American beer. And uh, they have a problem in the market because... Um, because most beer were the same. So they, they didn't have a great selling point. And um, then they took this expert named Cloud Hopkins. And um, he told them that he wanted to come and have a tour uh, in their factory. And he saw how they actually produce and manufacture the beer. And he saw that they boil out uh, the water in um, a special tanks. So he told them, this is amazing. I want to tell this story. And they told him, no, there is nothing to tell because all the beers are made the same. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I don't care. I don't care because when we say this is how we do it, this implies that other brands don't do it the same way. And um, they are the first in the market. So this is a good story. A, t a story that tells something about the way you do things, about your legacy, about your history. It doesn't matter. You just need to connect people. Yeah. And connect is probably try to be tell your own spe special story, maybe to be different, which is much smarter than to say I'm better than the other one, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. It's actually the, uh, a good story doesn't spell out what they want. You understand it unconsciously. Yes, yes. Great, Lira. So what are you working on these days? Um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I'm quite busy. I have this many um, research that I conduct. And um, I'm writing a new book. And, um, nice. Yes. So, and also I have this master class and um, 
of people's skills and how to negotiate, how to tell a good story, how to make decision, intuition. So uh, actually a lot of my plate right now, on my plate right now, but um, um, just need to be thankful for that. Yes, yes. So and how our listeners can follow you and keep updated with your work? So I have a website um, and I um, uh, quite often post on LinkedIn. Uh, however, it's in Hebrew, <laughs> but there is a great <laughs> translation. And I have also my podcast um, that uh, I, I think regularly, once in two weeks, I... Uh, I record a, a, a podcast and um, mainly my website. Great. Great, Lira. It was a pleasure. Anything else you want to add? Um, no, we, I really enjoyed our talk. Yes. Thank you so much, Lira. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.